Hello everybody, my name is Sam Knights. I'm a barrister and adjunct at the University of Miami. Um, thank you to Lime Crime Festival and to its founder Paddy McGrain, whose idea this panel was. I'm absolutely delighted um, that we're co-hosting it with Shoot Festival. Um, it's one of two events that Lime Crime is doing over this weekend on criminal justice and it's great to see these alongside the more traditional crime fiction events that you get at a literary criminal festival. This panel has obviously been prompted directly by the brutal killing of George Floyd in police custody in Minneapolis. It's rightly shocked people the world over. It's led to a wave of protests in the US and the UK. But it's also led to many people of all ages, all backgrounds, all political persuasions and all colour to stop and ask questions about policing, about criminal justice and about the role that racism plays in these systems and in our societies. And it's interesting to note that four of the five top selling non-fiction books listed today by the New York Times are about racism and race relations and book lists in the UK are showing similar trends. The three panellists I hope we'll have this evening have been um, deeply involved working with these issues for decades. I'm going to um, introduce them briefly, um, separately, and then put questions to them. And, and then there'll be time for Q&A um, from you all. So please do put questions in the um, Q&A box, which you see at the bottom of the screen. Um, if you want to chat or ask um, or say something or make a comment, you can put it into the chat box, um, which you'll see also at the bottom of the screen um, in the middle. Um, I was going to um, begin tonight's event with um, a very special guest, Kenny Reams, who, as you know, um, is dialing in from um, his prison cell in Arkansas. We're waiting for um, Kenny to dial in. Obviously, you'll understand that the logistics um, for him dialing are not that straightforward. So what I'm going to do is actually effectively sort of introduce you to Kenny and tell you a little bit about Kenny. But then I'm going to go over to um, George Kendall, his um, attorney who's based in New York, and we'll, um, we'll, we'll speak to George first. And then as soon as Kenny um, comes in, we will get Kenny um, because he absolutely loves to um, speak and he's incredibly thoughtful and insightful. So hopefully we will um, have Kenny with us um, by the, um, by the um, end of the evening. Um, Paddy McGrain has just raised his hand. Um, I'm not sure. Why, Paddy, if you want to say something, Paddy, I'm afraid I can't unmute you, but if you want to put something in the chat box, please, um, please do. Um, and I should say that the event is being recorded and um, will hopefully be made available on, on our YouTube channel for anybody who isn't here this evening. So I, I wanted to say um, a few words about Kenny, first of all. I mean, I've known Kenny for 20 years since we met um, in Arkansas in the summer that I was working as an intern at the Legal Defence Fund with George. Kenny, he's an artist. He's had exhibitions all over the world with his French um, artist wife, Isabel, who is, I, um, I believe, Zoomed in this evening. He's a poet. He's a writer. He's had an award-winning documentary made about his life, um, Freeman, and the details for that are in the chat box, so do watch it if you haven't seen it. He set up a charity which um, seeks to educate people about the death penalty. He speaks at universities and events all over the world, including at um, University of Miami, where I teach. But Kenny's also somebody who's been incarcerated on death row in solitary confinement in a nine by four cell in a maximum security prison since he was 19 years old. And as an intern, I worked on a part of Kenny's appeal against his conviction and sentence, which was born out of a trial, which was a paradigm example of criminal injustice and systemic racism. Critical witnesses were not called by his trial attorney, who had a docket of about 400 plus cases um, on, his, um, on his books at that time and barely spent any time at all um, working on Kenny's case. Um, Critical witnesses weren't called who would have been able to give evidence that Kenny did not have the gun and did not intend for anybody to be shot, but weren't called. No ballistics um, expert um, evidence was called. No witnesses in mitigation were called. And systemic issues, systemic race issues, meant that all of the potential African-American jurors, bar one, were struck from the jury. And these were just some of the egregious um, errors in his, uh, um, in his trial. 
two years ago, Kenny, after 18 years, extraordinarily, 18 years waiting for his appeal to be determined, was given judgment by the state Supreme Court. His, his death sentence was quashed, but indefensively, the court failed to order a retrial, which left him with a life sentence um, without parole. George, I want to, um, I'll, I'm going to introduce you now as well, because I want to kind of bring you in and ask you really to sort of contextualize um, Kenny's case. George, um, George has been Kenny's um, appellate attorney for the last 27 years. He's been representing clients on death row since 1979, and he's worked at the Legal Defense Fund for 15 years before moving to his current firm, um, Patton Squire Boggs, where he works exclusively on pro bono death penalty appeals. He's brought appeals on behalf of hundreds of indigent death row inmates raising constitutional issues before, including before the US Supreme Court. And my four month internship at the Legal Defence Fund, um, which was organised by a UK charity called Amicus, where I worked with George and in particular worked on Kenny's case, was one of those absolutely life changing periods for me. Um, as a young lawyer starting out, um, it's um, if you if you haven't been worked or you haven't worked at the Legal Defence Fund, um, it's it is one of the um, foremost civil liberties organisations in the US. It was founded in 1940 by Thurgood Marshall, who was the first African American um, uh, Supreme Court Justice. It was pivotal in the civil rights movement and uh, won the case of Board Brown and the Board of Education, which desegregated the American school system. I would have happily carried on working at the Legal Defense Fund, um, but for the stringencies of US immigration law. So um, I had to return to England and to the bar. But George, I, I wonder if you could start off and let me get you to unmute yourself, first of all. I wonder if you could just start off by contextualizing um, Kenny's trial and, and really what, you know, what were the sort of the, the, the really serious race, systemic race issues in that trial and how widespread um, are they in the American justice system? Well, Kenny's case arose in, from Pine Bluff, Arkansas in 1993 at a moment when our country was, um, very, very supportive of very, very harsh sentencing for many crimes. And the death penalty, the use of the death penalty was very popular. Uh, this was a classic case of two 18-year-old African-American men, both of them uh, immature, um, uh, and there was a white victim. That is your classic case uh, for white prosecutors seeking the death penalty, and that's what they did. Uh, Kenny's co-defendant had an African-American lawyer who very, very wisely told him, if you go to trial, you're going to lose and get the death penalty. Uh, Sam, as you've already said, Kenny's lawyer was so overwhelmed with his caseload, and he only worked part-time as a public defender. Uh, he didn't even begin to properly represent Kenny. And uh, so he went, to, Kenny went to trial. There was but one African-American on the jury, and he was but very quickly convicted and sentenced to death. So this was very typical of what was going on in the country uh, at that time. And Kenny's case really has many of the examples of what's wrong with the American death penalty, with very bad lawyering, racial discrimination influencing, not simply the prosecutor's decision to charge the case as a capital case. Prosecutors didn't need to do that, but they chose to do that. And then by having virtually this almost all white process, uh, all the judges who've looked at Kenny's case are white, all the prosecutors were white. Uh, the only person of color that has gotten close to Kenny's case is this one juror. Um, and so after 27 years of very hard work, uh, we were able to persuade a very conservative judge in Arkansas that Kenny was likely innocent of this crime. Um, and he was willing to vacate the death sentence, but he was not willing to vacate the capital murder conviction. And so as we speak, we are working hard to um, get the conviction overturned so we can start over so Kenny can really have a shot at real justice, which he's never had. And, and how widespread is this? I mean, when you read Kenny's case, it is, it is horrendous, but I mean, how representative is it of other cases um, it's, in, it's, it's, in the US? There are many other cases like Kenny's case uh, where race 
uh, significantly influenced whether the case was charged as a capital case. Uh, the jury was either all white or nearly all white, where the defense uh, uh, did not have the means uh, or the experience to represent uh, somebody charged capitally. Uh, it goes on and on. So his case was very representative at the time. Mm. And there's a, I mean, there's a particular problem, isn't there, with race and the death penalty. There's this sort of very long historic link with slavery and the, the you know, appalling treatment of African Americans through that, but beyond, and the way that the death penalty is sort of used as a tool against um, African Americans. I mean, do you want to just say something about that? I mean, which is, you know, it's, it's obviously one of the worst aspects of the um, criminal justice system and different, of course, to what's going on in the UK. We, we no longer have the death penalty. Well, well, it's not hyperbole to say that, you know, our modern death penalty has grown out of lynchings and just summary judgment. When you go back and look at how the death penalty was imposed a uh, hundred years ago in this country, uh, it was a very quick process. I represented a man in Louisiana who three times in, 19, in the 1960s was tried for capital murder uh, before all white, all male juries. And within the first jury took 30 minutes to death sentence him, the second took 10 minutes, the third jury took three minutes. To, death, to convict and death sentence. I mean, these were just legal lynchings. And if you don't have lawyers with experience and with resources, you can't have a fair trial. And everyone knows that. And Kenny was a victim like many other young men and women, uh, many of color, who were forced to go to trial with uh, defense lawyers who were not prepared to properly defend them or make the system work properly. We've had 185 people identified as innocent off of death row, which is a staggering number. And it's largely because in many of those cases, there was not a defense to make the system work, to test and put the state really to its burden of proof. So these cases have uh, exposed many problems. Uh, with regard to racial discrimination, the death penalty, the Supreme Court in 1987 issued a decision of great shame, McCluskey versus Kemp, which made it uh, virtually impossible to use statistics showing racial bias to uh, check and control the administration of the death penalty. And so um, one of the reasons why our country is going through this extraordinary moment now is that the courts have largely not been interested and not taken on um, these cases where there's very clear evidence of racial bias, racial uh, influence in these decisions, and the court system has been willing to look the other way. Many of us here now are hopeful in this very special moment uh, that took one tr horrible tragedy after another, that our country now is beginning to look at this issue of how brown and black people have long been treated very differently, very un un unequally compared to whites in this country. And we are hoping that we are at the beginning of uh, turning the corner in a lot of positive way. It's not gonna, we're not gonna be able to remake society completely, but hopefully there are gonna be some real changes in corporate America, in our court system, in our police departments, and many institutions that will lessen these burdens and injustices that have been infl inflicted upon African-American people here, uh, brown people here for decades. I mean, George, you've been working in this area. People like Brian Stevenson have been working and speaking out. Academics have, you know, written very detailed reports saying all of this. But what do you think is different, perhaps, about the moment now? You, you said just now that it could be a sort of a pivotal moment, perhaps. Well, I think what do you think is going for, on? For, for I think if, you, if I were African-American, I think one thing that the African-American community is seeing is that many whites have joined them in taking to the streets saying this has got to end. Uh, I have a 23 year old niece in Los Angeles who has never been politically active, who for two weeks uh, was on the front lines and demonstrations there. And what happened in, in Los Angeles is that all the white demonstrators would put themselves ahead and they'd be right where the police were. And the brown and, and black people would be behind the white. So if people were gonna get the crap beat out of them, and some of them did, 
it would not be black and brown bodies, it would be white bodies. This was, had rarely been seen before. But uh, corporations now are, are looking at all kinds of different changes to enhance employment and promotion. Should have done this 50 years ago. It's happening now. Uh, there is a rethinking uh, of police, of how police ought to uh, relate to the community um, in a way that I've never seen in my entire life. And I think that while in, when this sort of ends, uh, while there are gonna be some places where there's not gonna be much change, I think there's gonna be a lot of places where a police department is gonna approach its work very differently. It's gonna be smaller. And a lot of these burdens and jobs that have been forced upon the police that is not police work are gonna be transferred to other appropriate resources. Um, I think uh, there's gonna be better a focus on education in some places because that's a problem here. So I think we are having now a, a there's more honesty uh, in the debate than we've had. But let me just say this, at the same time, we're, this, this effort to, to heal some of these wounds is taking place at a time when our president is doing everything he can to divide us. And he is going to run a campaign, he is already running a campaign that's largely based on race. There's dog whistle after dog whistle to appeal to his base, to really rev up his base. And so where we're gonna be in three months, I don't know. And I don't think many other people know, but there is going to be a backlash. And the question is whether, and one, I think one uh, telling moment is going to be is whether this backlash is going to be able to push down these efforts, these very positive, hopeful efforts, or whether we're going to be able to push back at that backlash and say enough, we are going to move forward and make this a, a society where uh, everyone is, is equal. I wanted just to come back to this um, issue around de-policing, which you, which you mentioned. It's been spoken about quite a lot in the, in the media. So, I mean, we see in the America police in all sorts of places that you wouldn't normally expect to see police, including in virtually every single public school, in every single higher education campus. Um, there are obviously problems of police stopping and searching large numbers of you know, people. So what, I mean, what do you, do you think police de-policing is um, part of the solution? And what does it, how does it need to happen? You know, progressive police officers or police chiefs in this country believe that they would gladly uh, uh, take on 50% of the work that they have now. I mean, if somebody walked down my street today with no clothes on uh, doing something, uh, uh, a lot of police would say, don't call us, you know, call social services, call somebody else. But right now, uh, they're the resource that's getting all the money. So they take those, all those calls and they're, they're not trained for these, and that's why we have all these problems. I think there's gonna be far less of the police citizen, any unnecessary encounter. I think we're gonna see far less uh, cars pulled over. Uh, that's an inherently dangerous situation. We have, we have more guns in this country than we have people. We have 340 some million people in our country. There are more guns out there. Than that. So every one of those encounters can be rife with things that can get out of control very quickly. And I think uh, progressive police are saying, you know, 90% of these cases, we don't need to stop anybody. If somebody's going way too fast, we can uh, uh, send, their, uh, send them a ticket or whatever, or go pick them up later. So many of these discussions were not going on in many places a month ago. I mean, it's, it's hard to believe that uh, George Floyd was alive five weeks ago. Uh, the Congress of the United States passed major legislation uh, in the last two days on this. That was unthinkable uh, two months ago. So uh, a lot of people of good faith, of all colors in this country, I think see that this is a moment that we can't let waste. And these are, the, all these problems flow from the original sin in this country. And we see that this is a moment where we can really try to uh, steer this country in a much fairer, positive direction if we all sort of pull together. 
Mm-hmm. And what, what about the, um, I mean, the, 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 ju- the judges um, in the States? I mean, one of the big differences, again, between the US and the UK is that you have these um, elected judges who are essentially political um, appointments. But there has also, in the New York Times, there's been this sort of, you know, reporting that some of the state um, Supreme Court judges are you know, fessing up, they're considered themselves as part of the problem. I mean, are we seeing any shift, do you think, in opinion at that level? Or do we essentially what? have a, a problem with a conservative judiciary in, in, in the States? Well, we have, th- that has been a problem, but I think what we're, again, what we're seeing that we've never seen before is we're seeing not one court, but we're seeing court after court uh, come out and say, we've got to come clean, we've been part of the problem. And that would have that was unthinkable uh, six months ago, uh, six weeks ago. Um, at the same time, we have uh, the President Trump has put 200 judges on the federal courts, and these courts are appointed and they have life tenure, and they have life tenure for a reason, so that somebody can come in with a very unpopular client with a good legal claim and win, and that judge isn't thrown off the bench. I support that kind of a system, but he's been only putting a very young, very conservative, and mostly white uh, male judges on the bench. And that is going to be a problem. Mm-hmm. In some states, uh, the, in, for example, in North Carolina, which is a very, it's a battleground state, uh, that state Supreme Court is a very good Supreme Court now. Uh, but other state courts are, are not that way. But like every place else, Sam, it, there is a discussion going on uh, about what those courts need to do uh, to, to make sure that, that when they open their doors, they are doing a better job at fairness than they ever have done before. Great, I, I want to um, bring in one of the questions that we have um, for, uh, for you, George. Um, for, this is from Angela Choke. Um, she says, we've seen a negative reaction from American police towards journalists since George Floyd's death. Does um, the black community fear that rather than the situation improving, there could be a backlash against them? Yes, I think there are many communities that fear that. I think, you know, one way to explain why Joe Biden is the nominee of the Democratic Party is that, you know, he was he was gone until his until the South Carolina primary and the South Carolina primary, the black vote saved Joe Biden. But in a in a very fundamental way. I think African Americans in the South understand if you try to change too quickly, you're going to get a horrific white backlash. And while there were other candidates, more progressive candidates, who might be a better fit for America at this moment, I think those voters understood that if we choose somebody like that, um, that person might not make it. And I think I say that because I think that uh, there's a feeling that there is going to be this backlash. Uh, If we try to move too quickly, it's going to give that backlash more oxygen. Uh, I guess what I'm saying is that we're aware of that. And now it's our responsibility to, to acknowledge those fears, but to try to include uh, any of those people of good faith and try to move with them. But you're absolutely right. We have periods in our history where there's been these horrific backlashes, which take decades to recover from. Thank you. Um, George, I'm going to bring in Shomik now and, and have a look at some of the issues that we've been exploring with you um, on, the, on, on, on this side of the pond. Um, before I do, I should just say a big hello to Isabel, um, Kenny's wife, who is with us. Um, she can't, we can't unmute her, but um, hello, Isabel. I'm absolutely thrilled um, that you're here. Shomik, um, I want yeah, to turn to you and um, to look at what's going on in the, um, in the UK. I'm absolutely delighted um, you're able to join us this evening. Shomik is a partner at Bat Murphy. He's one of the leading criminal and civil, civil liberty lawyer lawyers in the UK working in this area of actions against the police and other state agencies. He's been involved in numerous high profile cases, including the ongoing undercover policing inquiry. He represents a number of the individuals and families involved in the Grenfell Tower inquiry, and he won a landmark judgment in the European Court of Human Rights in relation to an individual's inclusion 
on the National Domestic Extremism Database, a database I suspect that many of us didn't know existed. Um, a lot of his cases have involved issues of race discrimination by the police and other state departments. As with George, he's one of those lawyers you definitely want on your side and um, not against you. Um, Shomik, um, can you, from your work and your experience, can you talk about some of the, the difficult issues in the criminal justice system for black, Asian and minority um, people here? Thanks very much. I mean, I think that listening to George, it's remarkable the similarities between the issues that black and Asian minority ethnic people face on both sides of the pond. Um, here, I think the problem is, as it always has been, and that's institutional racism. And it's a phrase that has been underused in public discourse until recently. You know, there was a, a great usage of the term around the time of the Stephen Lawrence inquiry report over 20 years ago. Uh, it seemed to tail off. Police forces seemed to be able to say publicly, we don't have a problem anymore. That was so long ago. We've now taken steps to remedy it. Um, but it's worth reminding ourselves of the definition of institutional racism. And it's a collective failure of an organization to provide an appropriate and professional service to people because of their color, race, culture, or ethnic origin. And it can be detected in, in processes, attitudes, and behavior that amount to discrimination through prejudice, ignorance, and thoughtlessness, and racist stereotyping. Um, which disadvantages many ethnic minority people. Now, we can find evidence of ongoing institutional racism um, in statistics, but also in the life experiences of many of the people that we represent, and so do so many other civil rights lawyers across the country. Um, I mean, starting with the statistics, if we consider that black and minority ethnic people are still far disproportionately searched on the streets of this country than white people by a huge margin, that margin is even bigger when it comes to powers which don't require a reasonable suspicion. So that's section 60, stop and search. Now section 60, stop and search, I don't know if there's an equivalent in the States, but it's essentially where the police will have an area where they consider, if they reasonably believe that there will be violence in that area, they can put a section 60 notice in place and that will allow police officers to search anybody without reasonable suspicion. Now clearly that can be in relation to a football game um, or it can be in relation to knife crime. But black people in Britain are 40 times more likely to be stopped and searched under that power. And that really is, uh, the reason for that I see is because if you take away the real requirement for reasonable suspicion, you're essentially asking officers to fall back on prejudice. They're not having to justify their actions. And so in terms of statistics, that's one of the key statistics that I would, I would say um, is evidence of institutional racism. If I take kind of the failures of the criminal justice system in terms of three strands, cases that we see day in, day out, the first would be ongoing police brutality on the streets. Um, and that comes from stereotyping. Um, given that this is a literary festival, I should probably reference some of the kind of stock phrases that we see in fabricated police officers' notebooks. We repeatedly see phrases such as superhuman strength. Uh, phrases such as, you know, strength far more than his stature. Um, you know, in all my years as a police officer, never I, had I come across a, a more violent 10 year old. I mean, literally, we see these phrases again and again and again, and they're indicative of, of racist stereotyping. So that's street level brutality. The next we see is in failure to investigate, um, and in particular, failure to investigate crimes against black people. Um, and that can be at the most serious end the murder of black people. And this stretches back to Kelso Cochrane, the racist murder which led to the Notting Hill Carnival every year, um, through to Stephen Lawrence, and ongoing cases that we see day in, day out. Um, quite often where a young black person will call the police for help, but when the police arrive, they are treated as the assailant, treated as the suspect. And finally, um, I would talk about the, the databasing um, which results in victimization. Um, you referenced the case of the domestic extremism database, which uh, my client John Catt was on. He's an elderly white man who's a, who's a pacifist. Um, the equivalent of that for the black community is the gangs matrix. And this has been criticized by Amnesty International. It essentially takes young black men predominantly and they're put on a database, regardless of whether or not they've ever committed any criminal offense through tenuous connections to someone in the family or someone in the community who they may have some tenuous connection with, 
who has once been involved in low level crime. And once you have that kind of a database in play, it really changes the relationship between an individual and the state where that individual becomes perpetually under suspicion and it results in day-to-day -day malpractice in terms of stop and search um, and the sharing of this information with numerous other state agencies. So I think it manifests in this country in ongoing police brutality on the streets, failure to investigate and victimization through databasing. I mean, the cases that you're working in, they require a lawyer who is, um, first of all, absolutely um, expert in this particular area, whether it's you know, an action against the police or um, in relation to sort of surveillance and databases. But you, you need a lawyer who's you know, dogged and is there for the long term. I mean, your cases take years. Um, how easy is it for people to get good representation um, in this area? Is, is, is there legal aid always for the kind of cases that people would need help in, whether it's um, an inquest or whether it's an investigate, a failure to investigate, those sort of cases? It's incredibly difficult. I mean, if we take the case of, um, of deaths in custody in particular, um, given the brutal murder of George Floyd that we've all witnessed. In, that, in, in inquests, families are just not on an equal footing with state agencies. Families can turn up to an inquest um, unrepresented where each of the officers are, are represented and agencies of the state are, are represented as well separately. Whole teams of lawyers acting for the other side. Um, and, and that is one of the recommendations, for example, in the Angelini Review, which we'll come on to, to later, which was that there needs to be a quality of arms. That's in the inquest setting, and, and there have already been recommendations to government to correct that gross disparity, um, which leads to injustice. The second is in relation to actions against the police in particular. There are advice deserts all over the country where people just can't find a lawyer who's able to do that work. There have been successive cuts to funding for that area of law over the years, um, making it much more difficult for individuals to access free legal advice. Um, you know, nowadays, even if you're in receipt of state benefits, if your income is so low, you may not qualify for legal aid to take a case against the police. Um, and there was also the abolition of the recoverability of, of um, after the event insurance. Essentially, it used to be the case that if you didn't qualify for legal aid, you may be able to get after the event insurance to cover you against any adverse costs. Now, this is a difference between our system and the states. You know, in the states, there's no loser pays principle. Um, in, in our country, we have a loser pays principle. So you take an action against the police and you lose and you don't have any cost protection from a union or from um, insurance or legal aid, and you could end up having to pay the costs of, of the police legal team. Um, and these cases are hard fought by police forces across the country. Um, sometimes, and quite often, they're fought in the face of compelling evidence that chief constables should really be accepting liability, sitting around the table with families, apologizing, and disciplining officers. Now that very rarely happens because chief constables adopt such a defensive attitude and the, the lack of avail availability of, of public funding or any other way to protect yourself from adverse costs is a real, has a real chilling effect on the victims of police misconduct. I want to come on um, in just a minute to some of um, the um, things that need to be done to change um, this system. Um, but before I do, I just wanted to go back to this sort of stop and search because um, you spoke about section 60 and this suspicionless search power, which I think is pretty unique um, um, across the world. I think there are very relatively few other examples of this, but it's, I mean, it's so damaging on um, so many levels because it really breaks down the relationship at the community level between um, police and the BAME community because if they're constantly being um, targeted completely disproportionately and unfairly then of course they're much less inclined to help the police when you know when they need information um, so it, it it's it sort of works against the police on 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 many levels um, but one of the things the police always say of course is well you know we've had our funding cut you know in terms of our intelligence um, you know, databases. We've gone from, for example, in London, in the metropolitan area, we've gone from having a borough intelligence um, service to having just one for the whole of London. So we have much less sophisticated intelligence about who's actually carrying out these, um, these um, gang, gang attacks. And therefore, we have to go about stopping people. And then the gang matrix shows that the gangs in the area are predominantly young and black, for example, and therefore that's their justification. But you can, I mean, how does, I mean, does that stack up legally as a justification? Uh, no, in, in short, no. I mean, if we think about it, obviously 
um, the police and, and state agencies, it would uh, be much easier for them if they could have information about every single one of us. And um, obviously we know now that they do um, through the Snowden disclosures and a lot of the powers that security services have. Um, it, was a, it was an argument that I often encountered in, in the case I was working on challenging the national DNA database. Um, and, you know, you would have police forces saying, well, the more information we have, the more we can actually protect innocent people, because if we have innocent people's DNA on the database, then we can rule them out of a, of a crime. But, you know, the logical consequence of that is that are you really saying you want to have a police officer or an agent of the state in every maternity ward taking a DNA sample from every child as soon as they're born? It's not, it would be considered abhorrent. And we all know that uh, persecution and even up to genocide starts with a database. And so this is why that kind of argument that, well, it would make the police's job easier. Many, many things would put a camera in everyone's house. That would make the police's job a hell of a lot easier. But we wouldn't stand for it because we're democracies or supposed to be. I want to I want to move on now to kind of looking at some of the things which um, do need to be changed. I mean, what's really striking, and this is something that David Lammy um, has spoken about as well, that, you know, as British, we're very good at carrying out inquiries. We're very good at having reviews. Um, we've had, you know, the aftermath of the Stephen Lawrence. We had the McPherson inquiry. Um, we had the Lammy review into BME representation in the criminal justice system. We had the Angelini report um, into deaths in police custody, the Williams report into the lessons learned from the Windrush scandal. And all of those reports were incredibly detailed, took a number of years and made very compelling recommendations, um, which unfortunately haven't yet been implemented in the most part. But what, I mean, what in your view really needs to happen to change the system? What are the sort of top things that you would say we should be doing? Well, what we don't need is another review, especially under this government, um, because it will be loaded and it will probably uh, intend to undo the great work of so many independent reviews um, and government reviews that have taken place over the years. Um, you mentioned the Angelini review. I mean, that was an independent review that was really hard fought for by bereaved families. The bereaved families um, where their loved ones die in police custody really becomes experts in in the law and the process, um, m much more so than many lawyers who, who, who would never have seen this kind of a case. Um, and Angelini made over a hundred recommendations, which would, if implemented, really um, turn the table on years of systemic injustice towards black people in this country. Um, you know, one of the things that was recommended is something that George touched upon, um, taking police out of the mental health crisis situation. Police officers generally don't want to be called to situations where they're dealing with someone who's having a mental health crisis. You know, mental health nurses and doctors are and should be trained to deal with those issues. And we, we've had far too many cases where a concerned family member, particularly the concerned family member of a young black man who is going through a mental health crisis, calls the police and it leads to their son or their brother's death. It's depressingly common and familiar. Um, and so taking police out of those kind of situations is, is a start um, and implementing all of these reviews that have, that have come in the past and, and, and that are fairly recent that were robust um, and really should have been implemented long ago. Um, as one of the, um, the mothers that we've represented and had the privilege to represent, Aji Lewis said recently, um, her son um, died um, after police contact. She said, what we need um, it might be more of a deterrent if police forces were genuinely concerned about facing charges. The police need to admit, admit mistakes and officers need to be prosecuted. It, it really is as simple as that. Um, and so how do we get to that position of officers being successfully held to account and, and prosecuted? Well, police officers need to speak out more against their other officers. You know, far too often we see officers placing loyalty to colleagues over honesty and integrity in the pecking order of what matters most. Um, and that needs to be done away with. Police officers need to speak out. Chief constables need to stop adopting defensive attitudes in relation to cases where the weight of evidence is overwhelming against their officers. You know, that can be because of their own defensive mindset, a reluctance to um, want to engage in a, a, a case which could lead to bad publicity and sometimes pressure from 
police unions and police federation, which I understand is also a big issue in, in the States. So I think those are the main changes that we really need to see here. We need to see a more effective police complaint system as well. Um, far too often we see the, you know, there is a need for an independent investigatory process. Now, after deaths in custody, they, they need to be preserved as crime scenes as if there has been a murder. There needs to be the same robust evidence gathering and, and crime scene preservation as we would see if it were uh, a murder inquiry. Um, we need to see the independent office of police conduct really show some metal um, and courage because the regulations need to change in places, but very often it's a, a lack of courage on their part to actually do the right thing in the face of overwhelming pressure from the police federation and police officers, which they really should be used to. Um, it's not a case of them sitting on the fence and quite often they mistake independence for neutrality. Um, our clients don't need neutrality. They need fierce independence and, and going where the evidence takes them. And so I think all of those changes really need to be made. Um, and they should have been made many years ago. Um, until they are, we'll continue to, to see the kind of cases that we do on a weekly basis. Yeah, I mean, this is a really, a, I guess, a question for, for both you and for, for George about how we actually go about changing the culture. I mean, one of the interesting things that was said in the Windrush report, which was looking into, obviously, into the Home Office and, um, and the scandal there, was that um, they didn't know their history. They didn't know the history, not just of the immigration laws, which obviously you would expect they would know but working in the immigration system, but they also didn't know the history of, of, of the of British colonization and decolonization. And that is pretty basic. And you're seeing this a lot, I think, in you know, institutions are beginning to ask themselves, do, does our history curriculum need to be written? Does our, you know, does our legal curriculum need to be written? I mean, for example, when I took law at law school, there, you know, the way that it's sort of presented is here are, you know, here are the here are the laws, you know. There is no kind of particular issue for anybody to abide by the laws. These are the criminal laws of the country. And it wasn't until I went to um, SOAS to the School of Oriental and African Studies, where, where I took a course on ethnic minorities in the law, that you look at the legal system from the perspective of somebody who isn't in the majority and how incredibly difficult it can be if the system is sort of stacked against you from the outset. So how, how do, I guess my question is, how do we change the culture of policing? Um, and, you know, do we need, you know, training, guidance, you know, different kind of education? And where, you know, where does it, where does it begin? Um, it may be too late if the training only starts, you know, at the, at the age, you know, somebody's already left school, gone through university. Um, George, I don't know whether actually we, we, whether you want to sort of um, I'll, I'll mute you, and perhaps you want to talk about that. So that I can unmute you. We are we're having these discussions, and, and Shamik, that was a, a wonderful description of the many problems that you that you face uh, in England. Virtually everything you said applies here equally, uh, but I think we now are looking at, for example. Most Americans have no appreciation for why police departments uh, began. And, you know, when you go back to the beginning here, they were really these offices that were put together to really um, control minorities. In Boston, it was the Irish. Uh, the Irish had a hell of a time with the Boston police for a generation until they became the police. Um, and you know, my good friend, Brian Stevenson, who um, one of the great missions of his organization now is to see that America understands our racial history, that we had this horrifically bloody civil war uh, that at least did away with slavery legally, but it didn't end the uh, ex exploitation and discrimination against people of color. And many white Americans particularly don't know that history. And he's committed the rest of his life and his, the work of his organization to uh, produce materials and disseminate those materials uh, throughout our culture. So that I, I think is when Americans read that, it's shameful to read. And most people who read that don't want us to continue to operate that way. And so I have, I'm an optimist, I think that um, if our educational system can really begin to teach our real history, um, that will be a big step forward. 
Shanek. Yeah, I think um, that's absolutely right here as well. I mean, you spoke, George, about the original sin in, in terms of slavery, and you know that's the same with Britain, um, and also colonialism and imperialism. You know, the, the denigration and dehumanization of black, Asian, minority, ethnic people was hardwired into our society and economies. It's a justification for exploitation, wage exploitation, um, and has been for many years. And, and you know, it's, it's uh, I think someone, I remember who it was recently said in relation to coronavirus, you've got to act like you've got it and take steps to stop it from spreading. And the same goes for racism. You've got to act like you've got it and, and work out how you can identify it in yourself and identify it in those around you. Um, before you can actually start to defeat it. Um, and that's really what we see prevalent in, in far too many state institutions, you know, whether that's the, the prison service or the healthcare settings um, or in the police service. I mean, in the UK now, we've got vast disproportionality in relation to COVID-19 deaths uh, with Black and Asian minority ethnic people, um, particularly those working in a healthcare setting. Um, you know, the failure to provide proper PPE here has led to numerous deaths of healthcare workers, the very people supposed to protect us, and disproportionately they are black and minority ethnic people who are underprotected. Um, so you know, the phrase um, in relation to policing, over-police and under-protected, still, still applies as it always has. Um, and understanding the origins of racism is really the only way to, to defeat it. I've got an interesting question here from um, Karen Kaur. Um, what's the Hispanic experience of access to fair criminal justice and do the, how do the speakers think that changing the demographics in the US affects the power balance in, in this area? And I, and I think, Shomik, it would be interesting after George's sort of answered that to kind of speak about this and the different issues perhaps for Muslim um, in, in the UK because there, is, there are you know, specific issues around terrorism legislation and, and, and which have actually impacted very um, disproportionately on the Muslim community and but not necessarily on the, on, the, on the black community. So perhaps George, do you want to talk about the Hispanic experience and whether that's been an issue in the US? Oh, hang on, I've got to unmute you. Yeah. We're talking. We're, we're talking now. Our discussion now is about about black and brown people, and the virtually almost everything I said about the the many ways that being African American in our society uh, disadvantages you, and particularly with regard to the police citizen encounter or by going to court, it applies in the same way to Latinos. Uh, but we are seeing in some states now. Uh, fast growing populations and there are now district attorneys and there are more public defenders who are Latino than ever before. There, there are more judges who are Latino than ever before. So I think that uh, is going to lead to very uh, necessary change. Um, but, but if you're, and it's not like poor whites have a great either, but uh, Latinos, by and large, face all the problems that uh, our African-American brothers and sisters do as well. Thank you. Shomik, do you want to just, hang on, let me unmute you. Do you want to just, um, I mean, speak about the sort of the different impact for, say, Muslims and the terrorism legislation? Yeah, well, I mean, look, all people of colour in this country, and it sounds like in the States, face discrimination of different degrees and different types. Um, I, it, it, it has, a, I would say in the kind of cases that I see, there is the stereotype of the angry black man, which is, is more applied to young black African Caribbean, black British people than it would be to Asian people. Um, I would say that in relation to Asian people, there is now this stereotype in relation, particularly Muslims in relation to some kind of allegiance with um, those who would espouse um, jihadi viewpoints and, and be terrorists essentially and, and we've seen the data by databasing in relation to protesters and, and black people, black African people in relation to um, the gangs matrix replicated in the prevent program in relation to Muslims where we have innocent Muslims who are placed on the prevent program or 
um, alerted by generally white teachers, white doctors, um, white state agents representatives into programs which are wholly unjustified and which have a really detrimental impact. Um, so I think that there is the same discrimination, it just takes its different forms and, and the origins of it are from different stereotypes, essentially. Yes, I mean, certainly in the, in the cases I do in the immigration arena, um, where the, um, the special immigration court is used so that the, it's, there are cases involving terrorism, alleged terrorism, where the individual's not told the reason for not being given nationality or being stripped of their British nationality um, or being um, disciplined in some way, put under some kind of house arrest. Uh, every single one of my clients is, um, is, is Muslim. And of course, the difficulty with those cases is you never know the evidence against you. You're only given it in the most general of terms, you know, terrorism, extremism. I mean, terms like extremism are used all the time in our courts, but they have no legal definition. There is no legal definition of um, what it is to be an extremist. So it's a, such a problematic sort of area. Um, and just, George, just picking up what you said about um, poor whites. Um, in David Lammy, um, our um, Labour MP who um, is shadow chancellor, his, in his report, he, um, he specifically notes that all of the recommendations he makes around improving the criminal justice system, which would help the um, BAME population, would also help um, poor white working class people. Um, so I just wanted to um, raise that. Um, I, there is a question here, or in, it's in the chat box. No, let me see if I can find this. Um, Oh, well, Belinda, Bo um, Belinda Borden, um, who um, she notes that she says, read Danny Dorling, this is on the issue of education, read Danny Dorling and Sally Tomlinson in Rule Britannia, Brexit and the End of Empire, about the inadequacies of our history and geography teaching in schools and universities. I mean, that's absolutely something which is um, being thought about at the moment. Um, but there's a question, we've got very little time, but very, very quick question um, from Rowena Richards. What can we do in the UK to help ban chokeholds by the police in America? Um, I'm not sure who should answer, answer that. I'm going to unmute you both anyway. <laughs> there we well, over here real quickly, we have been, oh, we've been, it's been overwhelming to see the support of folks all over Europe uh, uh, after the horrific killing uh, of George Floyd. And I think that that kind of continued attention uh, and effort is invaluable to ref a positive reform over here. I can say that I think the chokehold um, is on almost everyone near the top of the list of police tactics that has got to be finally forever retired. Uh, that oftentimes this hold is placed on where there are many other police officers around. There's no need to use it and it's still being used. So we, we are grateful for the support in the last six weeks and we hope it will continue. And I would say just in the UK in relation to the kind of implements that are used on detainees, which cause very serious injury and, and sometimes death, there's vast disproportionate use of tasers, um, disproportionate use of spit hoods. Um, handcuffs, batons, you know, across the board there's disproportionate use on black and minority ethnic people in this country and and all of that could be campaigned against justifiably on the basis of the impact on those people. Show me, thank you. Um, with immac immaculate timing, Kenny has actually dialed in, so I'm going to see, I mean we would actually ordinarily finish now but I'm not going to finish without um, giving the floor to Kenny. Um, let's see if we can actually um, um, get him patched in. Um, Kenny, can you hear me? Yes, uh, I can hear you, Samantha. Oh, I can't tell you how wonderful it is to hear your voice, Kenny. And you are an absolute, you are amazing. Um, you really are getting um, dialed in um, to this. So, Kenny, you've missed all the lovely words that I said about you. I'll, I'll, I'll send them to you. And, um, and, so, and I won't repeat them um, here. We're, we're actually, at, well, we're supposed to be at the sort of end of where we would be. But I absolutely, of course, want you to um, to have a chance to speak. And a lot of people I know um, have, you know, have zoomed into this, um, particularly to 
um, to hear you. Uh, we, we, I've been speaking to, um, to George and to Shomik about you know, what's going on generally in the criminal justice system um, and the, the differences and the, and the alarming similarities actually between the um, justice system and racism in the justice system um, between the, um, the UK and the US. Um, but I, I mean, you've been speaking about these issues for a long time and you've been living through um, these issues um, for a very long time. Kenny, how, how do you see it from your perspective? And I also wanted to ask you what it was like growing up and how you experienced policing um, when you were growing up in Pine Bluff, Arkansas, um, you know, up until you, you were 18 when you were arrested. And do you think things have changed um, for African-Americans growing up in Pine Bluff? Lots of questions, sorry. Well, uh, first of all, I would like to say, I'm sorry that I'm late. This is not normally Kenny. Uh, I just got crosswired with the timing, so please forgive me for that. Um, my them uh, crime festival, I asked that much. And then second of all, I would like to say thank you all for giving me this opportunity and platform to allow my voice to be heard and to speak on these issues. You asked me about um, my thoughts on policing, crime, and those things from the aspect of when I grew up. I, I will have a lot to say about that, but I think I will start in by saying this on that subject. My thing with the police as a little kid was the social aspect of it, not the getting in trouble with the law or any of those things. As a little kid, I felt that it was something wrong with how the police would come to my house and deal with my family. I didn't feel that it was right. And this is me as a little kid. My parents or anyone didn't tell me this. This was me getting this through observation. I would wake up some mornings and it would be one o'clock in the morning, my mother and my stepfather would be fighting. They married. They would be fighting for some reason. Domestic disturbance is what it is. Nobody is trying to kill each other or whatever, but they fight me. So being that we was poor, my mother would always wake up me screaming to call the police. I would jump up, see what was going on, see that they was fighting. Let me jump on my bicycle and ride to the store because we didn't have any money to pay for a phone back then, you know? and called the police, dial 911, and I called the police, ride my bicycle back home. They still fighting, two o'clock in the morning. You know, I have to get up and go to school at the same time. But these things are throwing me off balance at the same time. Well, the police would arrive. Sometimes they would be back at the house before I actually made it to the house. Other times they would probably be reaching the vicinity together. And how they dealt with my step. My stepfather and my mother in this situation didn't make me feel like they was policing. It made me feel like they didn't understand what the situation and the issue was. This is a social issue. This is not a crime issue, you know? But they didn't have the answers for those things because they were thinking as trained police officers. They didn't understand that there was a need for social, social reckoning in this situation, not should somebody go to jail and have to bond out of jail or, or those things and then going into a court that's not really a family court and all of that. So I began to have a negative feel about the police. They're not here to help me. They're not here to help my kind. They don't even know what our problems are, even though some of them look just like me, black. And so that became an early fixture in my mind as a kid dealing with the police. Today, I still feel that we have that same type of societal issue in America when it comes to the police. I think that there's a lot of things that's wrong with the justice system when it comes to just the policing aspect. We're not talking about the crime aspect or the sentencing, just the police aspect. We're not even talking about the court aspect of it, just the police aspect. There's a whole lot that's wrong. What happened to George Floyd, it happened all the time. We just now have the opportunity to see these things through the camera lens. 
But let's talk about the people that are coerced to, to confess into crimes that they didn't commit. That's at the hands of the police. Yeah, they overfunded. We can put some of this money into the social issues. They have these people that have real problems in our society. We're not doing that. Have some things changed? You can say that when it comes to dealing with the law in some aspects. But it's moving at a snail's pace, at a turtle's pace, the change that is happening. And I'm saying this as an individual sitting on death row for the last 30 years of my life, trying to understand the criminal justice system, trying to understand solitary confinement, trying to understand the death penalty and all of these things with the many layers that come with them. And policing is just one of the issues that we have in America when it comes to our criminal justice system. So that's pretty much what I would say to that. And I'm sorry that my remark was long, but I was trying to help you your question. <laughs> no, you're well, you're as always incredibly articulate. I mean, Kenny, you've been, I mean, you've been reading about this, you've been speaking about these issues, you know more about, you know, the history of the death penalty than most people know in the States and about the criminal justice system. I mean, what, what do you think needs, what are the, what are the big things that need to change, do you think, in the, in the, in the policing system? Well, I wouldn't necessarily just say it's just within the policing because you can point to a number of things that we can say, well, this needs to be changed, that needs to be changed. I don't really feel that that is the actual solution. Meaning, if we came up with a way where we can make sure individual Miranda rights was fully understood for that individual, or if we came up with a way where we were able to make sure that police officers, when they get you in the room and think you committed a crime, that they don't beat on you or try to coerce you into uh, confessing to other crimes that you may not have committed. We can come up with the answer for all of those things, but there are still some underlying issues that will remain because of the systemic nature of the stuff. We would pretty much have to deprogram, and I say deprogram, our society way of thinking about crime and punishment and until we actually begin to have that conversation i think that we're only going to be the cat chasing its tail we can defund the police department that's good figure out ways how we can spend the money better that's good but we ain't talking about the racism we ain't talking about the disparities in the stuff you know, we ain't even talking about those issues. So once we have done those types of things, then we still have to deal with these other, you know, natures that comes with this stuff. So I think this is more of a how do we begin to have the conversation as a society about what we are doing when it comes to crime and punishment, period. Kenny, I mean, you, there's one you're doing around you know educating through your art i mean through the through the film as well i mean is is phenomenal um and um for those people who are listening in who um who haven't seen um kenny's art i mean he really he and isabel um really tells the story of the the history of the death penalty um through through art and through um installations um but I mean, Kenny, what, you know, what gives you the strength to do those kind of things? Because a lot of people in your situation wouldn't. They would probably sleep through their sentence, but you haven't. Um, in your film, you know, you say, I, I refuse to sleep in, on the bed. I sleep on the floor to keep myself awake because I want to kind of be conscious. So, but what gives you that strength, do you think, that inner strength? Just me as a fighter, Samantha. And I say that to you from the standpoint of being 18 years old and having the district attorney to tell me that they was going to sentence me to death for a crime when I didn't actually commit murder. In the core part of my being, I felt that that was wrong. I did not have any idea of what it would require to fight back against that ideology that action, you know, I end up on death row. And over the years, 
that I did on death row. I went through transformation, you know, and I'm still going through uh, deep parts of transformation also. But it was me along the way realizing that in order to overcome that moment in my life at 18 where they say that, you know, my life is not worth anything um, lying on me about, you know, being the trigger man in the crime, um, the, the racism that was spewed at me, you know, people in the courtroom calling me nigger and, and those types of things. Me trying to fight back against that. When I realized that it would be art, that would be my vehicle, my tool, my weapon, I just got up and started trying to use it in every form that I could, whether it be through poetry, painting a picture about something that will, you know, bring awareness, education, or understanding to somebody, uh, writing stories, whatever it was, and pretty much doing it now. <clears throat> Even if it's just simply using my voice to to try to give people a different perspective of whatever the, the issue of the conversation may be about when it comes to the criminal justice system. And I've used these things over the last maybe six years of my life for art. Over the last six years of my life as my weapon of pushing back and fighting back and trying to, at the same time, overcome this death sentence and this uh, the circumstance that I'm dealing with being, being in solitary confinement for all of these years. So it's art, it's art from the standpoint that motivates me from that point. I mean, a lo a lot of beautiful. Car no, carry on, Kenny. Sorry, I interrupted you. I said it is a very beautiful conversation starter. Yeah, I mean, a, a lot of people will really struggle, I think, to understand how you can produce the art that you do um, in in your cell. I mean, I know. You know, over the years, there have been you know, difficulties and with, you know, insane, you know, sometimes insane police um, prison regulations saying you can't have a certain size of paper or a certain size of book or, you know, that sort of thing. But, I mean, it, it is phenomenal. You've, you've painted, I think, well over 60 pieces of art. You've created um, installations. The art is currently in the, in, in the US, um, I think, in a warehouse and, and it's been shown it opened um, in the UK, your, your show opened um, at the Bridport Art Centre, which, um, which had a particular resonance because um, th there had been previously um, a, a factory which had produced um, nooses um, for use um, in, in hanging. And so, it, you know, it really meant, it spoke something to people, you know, who came to see it. And then it, it went to the Temple Church in London, which is, you know, one of the, the most prestigious churches in London and again I mean people were it's it's through that sort of art I think that people you know, under, you know understand something maybe they they wouldn't have read the, the the long report written by a lawyer or by an academic but but they do they do watch the film and they do um they do see the art show you're speaking to an audience of course of people who um are interested in in writing and literature as well as you know your experiences and and, and the criminal justice system and I'm going to send, um, make sure I can send to all the people who have come, the, they've got the link to your film um, and they've got the link to the, um, and to the link to the website um, as well. But um, we are, we're going, Kenny, we're going, to, we're going to have to wrap up because we're over time. But do you want, first of all, I want you to have the last word. Um, and, um, and I also want to say to you that we're going to, we're going to do Oxford University at some point. Oxford needs to be educated by you, I think. So we're going to do a, a something at Oxford University um, later um, in, in the year. But I want you to have um, the last word because people, you know, are, you know, they, as I say, they came in particular, they came to hear everything, but I know, um, I know lots of people wanted to hear you, um, you speak. Um, and, you know, you've written poetry and I've, you know, and I would love to you know, have time to, 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 um, to play some of that. But Kenny, please leave us with, you know, the, the thought, the last thought that you want us to hear from you. Well, um, what should I say? I mean, 
not sure. Uh, well, I will say this, and I'm saying this from an artistic standpoint. Sometimes it takes art to open our eyes to injustice. Sometimes it takes art to open our eyes to injustice. I don't know why that is, but I believe it to be true, and I know it's true because I'm living it. If it wasn't for my art, a lot of people wouldn't need to know who I am. You know, they wouldn't know about my story or the fact that I'm sitting in prison or solitary confinement for 30 years. The circumstances that led me here, be it a, you know, what I would say justified or not justified, circumstances in my life. It is only through art. It's everywhere around us. And is speaking to us in so many different ways. When I said everywhere around us in music, you just mentioned the people here, you know, in the in the, the crime festival, the writers, how we portray injustice through literature, songs, so many different forms. I realize, I realize really, really early on that this was something powerful that I had been born with. I didn't didn't take any classes or study art or any of those things before I just started creating art like crazy over the last five or six years. But I've been artistic all my life. I colored, I painted, I did those things, even through the struggles that I was going through in life. But nobody nurtured that in me. The solitary confinement did. It nurtured it in me. And it also gave me understanding. It helped me see the world different. It helped me even think about myself different. And I'm talking about art. I'm not just talking about painting. I'm talking about being able to create what you see and then show it to somebody else and then see the light bulb go off and they see it and be like, wow, what was just that? I'm talking about that thing. <laughs> When it comes to injustice, man, none of us actually really know George Floyd, but we see him in pictures now because of the art that's been created. You can see that image over and over and over again and again, and you'll forever remember it because of that artistic piece that was created, and you know that's George Floyd. That's art, and it's speaking to us. I will say to you all, think about the injustice that art is speaking to you when you see it again. And you will know it when you see it. Trust me, except that because I'm saying these things to you, you will know it when you see it. It may be a piece of my art. Think about the injustice that's associated with it. Because there's a lot of people in prison right now that's creating art and they're not even getting the attention or time that I may be getting simply because that story is different from mine, but it's still injustice. How do we fight against these things? But I ask that you all be mindful, more mindful, and pay attention to it when it is an artistic form in front of you. Be it that soulful song when somebody is speaking about trying to overcome. That's what I would say. Be more mindful of art when it comes to injustice. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you all for the opportunity and to everybody in Zoom. And I really appreciate you all for being a part of this, this moment and allowing me to say the few words that I share with you all. Support the Free Kenny Reams movement. Go online. Look me up. Hashtag Free Kenny Reams. Sign the petition. I need your support. Penny, you said everything I was going to say at the end, but 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 and, and more. But please do watch the film Free Men. 
do go and sign a petition, free Kenny Reams, and support um, his charity. It's doing amazing work and invite Kenny to speak. Kenny, we will definitely um, speak again soon, my friend. Thank you so much for, um, for being able to join us. I really can't thank you enough. It's um, extraordinary having, um, having you here and adding your, you know, your words. Nobody can talk about these things better um, better than you. Um, but I also do want to say a huge thank you too to George um, and to Shomek um, for, for being here. Thank you all, um, all um, of you for coming, participating, engaging. Isabel, it's wonderful to have you here. Kenny, Isabel is, um, is with us as well. And please stay well and stay engaged and um, come back um, for more. Lime uh, Crime will be in um, person next year. And, um, but hopefully, this obviously would never have been able to happen in person. Hopefully we can um, bring um, our panelists back again next year for more. Thank you so much. Um, good evening. <laughs>